my computer. Susan is here. Welcome, Susan. Hi, Susan. And we have, uh, we've got 20 participants already. So there you wow. Go. Hi, Matt. How are you? I'm great. And yourself, Nick? Um, well, I'm sitting up here in Tahoe. I thought I'd have a weekend off. And uh, I've been actually looking forward to this because I've just been driving for four hours. I had to, believe it or not, I had to go to the wine spectator and drop off some samples in Napa. That helped me out. And then I, uh, another three hours to get up here. But I'm, this is iced down, cold. <laughs> I'm going to open it. Listen to this. Oh, hear that. Hear that sound. It's nothing like a cork. <laughs> Life is good, isn't it? It is up here in Tahoe, my friend. I bet. I bet. I haven't seen the beach yet, but cheers to you in Chicago, man. Cheers. Cheers. Welcome, everybody. Matt and Susan. Good to see you. Well, sorry, Susan. So the first thing, um, just feel free to ask me any questions, Matt, or if you see any questions in the chat box for those who, yeah. um, who are online and you want to put a question, you can just put it into the Q&A and Matt will, Matt will see that. It's also live on Facebook, and uh, what I'll do is I'm recording this right now, and I'll send the link to Matt later, and it'll be recorded on uh, YouTube, so you'll be able to watch it. But the first thing you'll notice before we get started is screw caps. I just we've just been having a big talk about the reincarnate, you know, nation of uh, screw cap because there's two forms of screw cap, Matt. I didn't know if you know this, but if you look at it like this one, it's shiny on the inside, and uh, that's a tin cap so this is an absolute seal if you sometimes you'll open them you'll see them white on the inside and a white yeah. is a cernax and cernax acts like a cork so it allows a small amount of um, oxidate oxygen to pass through like a cork the, but the problem is you don't need to do this yet but when the bottle's empty you can put your finger in here your non-covid finger and uh, <laughs> you'll feel a uh, you'll feel a ridge in the bottle and this is why when we open uh, a wine in a minute, I'll, I'll show you, but there's, a, there's always a bulb in the cork because the, the, the neck of the bottle is never completely straight. And so when you squeeze a cork, it expands itself against the glass and that's what prevents oxidation. But during that first 48 hours while the cork is re-expanding, air is going down the side of the cork. Yeah. That unfortunately uh, speeds up the evolution of wine, which we don't really like. And so I like using screw caps it's just that the U.S. and the uh, and the British, the two large uh, buyers of wine in the world, are not ready for screw caps yet. But as a winemaker, I love screw caps, and I actually think the wines age better with a screw cap too. Oh, really? Yeah, we had a one of the very first wines that had a screw cap was Jacobs Creek, and um, for those who remember Jacobs Creek Claret back in 1974, <laughs> started using screw cap. And I tell you, about four years ago, five years ago, I had a bottle of it. But not the 74, like the 78 or 79, I can't remember. The wine was great. It hadn't shown, really? hadn't fallen apart at all. Now, when uh, the screw caps, do you store them standing up then? Or is it okay to lay it down? Or Both. In fact, uh, it's the most flexible. You know, cork, you've got to, the theory is to keep it moist. I don't know, when was the last time, Matt, you put a cork in your mouth and sucked on that? I mean, cork has a flavor. I mean, we don't, when we make wine, I mean, this is fruit. Yeah. This is not wood. It's not cork. It's not acid. It's not alcohol. It's fruit. And so we have to, you know, as a winemaker, we really try and represent that. So, um, yeah. I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, hopefully this will work, and we can... Um, from the beginning i apologize so uh for those who are here we're obviously um being looked after by garfields and matt's matt's our uh, partner here and we're going to talk about four wines today we're going to talk about four fathers marlborough sauvignon blanc fidelity which is a red blend in fact it's the only blend that we make in chelsea and catherine and uh for those that didn't know i'm i'm originally from new zealand but i left new zealand and went to australia in 1984 came to California in 1989, and then we were living in Chile, came back to California in 1990, and I was a winemaker at Simi Winery, a little winery in Healdsburg, which is today where I live. Beautiful little town. For those that have not never been to Healdsburg, it's 
you know, four Appalachians all meet there. It's just fantastic. So we lived here for 30, 31 vintages now. So anyway, uh, I'm no longer a corporate winemaker. I gave up that in 2008. So this is a map of New Zealand, COVID free for those who can actually get there. I can get there, but um, I still have to go into quarantine for two weeks. I'm from up here. This is the biggest city in New Zealand called Auckland. And I'm from right up here. And uh, our vineyards that we're talking about today are down here in Marlborough. So a plane, would, this is about a two hour flight, believe it or well, an hour and three quarter flight. And this wind here, the, the wind howls through the, uh, the North and South Island. This is one of the most bumpy flights in the world for those who are interested in bumpy flights who like uh, roller coasters as you can see and so the little appellation of Marlborough which is where which is the, now the largest appellation in uh, in New Zealand for grapes it's made up of three valleys I'm just showing you two of them here so Richmond ranges to the north this is the Wairau Valley the Awateri Valley this is another rain these are the Wither Hills that run through the middle Cloudy Bay so the Wairau River flows into Cloudy Bay the Awateri River flows into Clifford Bay and the reason why Marlborough is really unique is because it's completely protected from the north by these large mountains, from the south by these large mountains, and to the uh, west by the Alps. And these Alps are big. These are bigger than Switzerland and Austria put together. So they're, they're big mountains wow. and uh, creates a beautiful rain shadow. And, and uh, that's why Marlborough is unique. It's warm. It's the warmest place in New Zealand. And uh, we're a long way south, so we have really long daylight hours as well. So our, our ripening, I know this is hard to understand, but we talk about growing degree days is the international term for figuring out how warm a place is. So growing degree days are the number of days above 10 degrees Celsius, the number of hours above 10 degrees Celsius during the ripening season. So in actual fact, Marlborough is only about 200 hours behind Napa. But because it's so far south, we don't get the intensity of heat. It's just a much longer season, if that makes sense. And that helps out uh, Sauvignon Blanc and Pinot Noir. Yeah, so it, keeps, climate. It, main, it maintains that freshness. It maintain, I'm not a big asparagus fan. Actually, let me go back to this map. So there's three, three regions that we grow grapes in. The first one is Dillon's Point, which is a very small area. Um, this gives you sort of the mineral uh, armpit, which is very popular with the British, you know, the armpit Sauvignon Blanc. This is the traditional area that gives you the asparagus. And this is the other area that gives you, this is the Brancot, the glaciers came off the Brancot and formed these river valleys. And this is what we call the, sorry, the uh, glaciers came off the Wither Hills and formed the Brancot. So these, these are the um, grapefruit citrus type wines the cut grass asparagus and the armpit. And then the, the valley over here, which we won't talk about is, is the green bean. So this is uh, an aerial view, but basically this is the vineyard that we're talking about today. There's a little hotel. The Sauvignon Blanc is grown in these two blocks. And for neighbors, this is the Rapara Road, Highway 82, 62. It's, it's very easy to find your way around, Matt. If you've, have you been to Marlborough? Uh, no, sorry. Okay, well, no. there's only there's only four roads. So there's no. Rapara Road, this one, um, New Renwick, Middle Renwick, and Old Renwick. Those are the four roads, so you always know where you are. But there's lots of roads that run north-south. No. And this road that runs north-south is this one here. It's called Jackson's Road. That's Cloudy Bay, Alan Scott, Matua, Top Vineyard, which is called Paratai, and Stonely, which I think is probably the most underrated wine sold in, uh, sold in the US. But Stonely, if, I don't know if you have Stonely in your stores, Matt, but it's a tremendous um, wine. But this area is called, including Cloudy Bay, Alan Scott, this area is, has become known as the Golden Mile. And so we sit within that Golden Mile. Oh. So that's pretty cool. Uh, everything we do is machine harvested. This is April 4th, 2020. Those are the, that's the, the Richmond range that I was alluding to. And you can see how dry those hills are and yet how green the grass is down the middle. And in California, of course, we don't have green grass. We, it's all dried out. So we have enough rainfall, enough humidity to keep the grass growing. This is why, 
you know, Matt, when was the last time you had a good bottle of New Zealand Cabernet? Um, that, it's been that quite would, a while, yeah. That would be never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to, yeah, no. Um, the former winemaker for Villa Maria had one, uh, Esk Valley. Oh, Alistair Mailing. Cool yeah. guy. Yeah, he is. We, He's a very good friend of mine. And, yeah, um, Esk Valley is an exception, but they, they're up in Hawke's Bay. They're in the... Uh, they're on the coast up on north on the North Island, but everything yeah, is nice. machine harvested because we want to bring everything in quickly. The the wineries are very close, and this is early morning. This is about five a.m. So we normally start picking at about ten or eleven o'clock at night when the when the temperatures drop, and so that the, the harvest is really cold. You know, when you hand harvest, you've got to do it with lights, and you need and so you're going to have more heat, etc. If you're going to pick during the day. So the key about Sauvignon Blanc is machine picking. Gene picking it fast, getting it to the winery quickly, and um, that's the way we do it. Look at that handsome devil. Can you hear that? I can't, no. Okay, hang on. Uh, that's a bummer. Let me just share my screen again. Sorry. Sorry, folks. I will... Uh, I just need to... Share my screen. Okay. Can you hear that now, Matt? Um, no. No. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. And I've lost you now, too. Can you hear that now? No, it's not playing on my end. I'm All right. sorry. All right. For some reason, I can't get you. Oil, which means that we don't get oh, as there we go. hydration. We don't have to irrigate right. as much. Sorry about that. And hence, we have a much darker, greener canopy. That also means we can push the, the ripeness a little bit further so we get more texture, more weight, more flesh, which is much more interesting for the US palate. A little fuller and richer, so the wine comes in the mouth kind of like this and has this textural element. Not too green, not too grassy, but a little bit more passion fruit. Today we're out here, we're, um, we're still about 10 days to two weeks away from Verazon. The berries are still pretty solid and uh, we've got a little way to go yet. And we expect to be harvesting here in about two months, probably. But anyway, it looks like a great vintage. We've got beautiful blue skies. We're out here in beautiful Marlborough. Anyway, 2018, Forefathers Sauvignon Blanc, Wax Eye Vineyard. So this is the, um, the wine that we're tasting. Uh, I'll stop sharing my screen for a second. So um, the, uh, that's, this goes to show, I have been down there in 2019, but I didn't get down there for the 2020 vintage, which is a real shame. Uh, I was supposed to go, I was in Chile, but of course, the world stopped on March 15, so I couldn't get yeah. it. So this is the bottle. So forefathers means, so when I was um, working with LVMH, so LVMH used to own Simi. Remember mm -hmm. LVMH owns handbags and yeah. perfumes, but they also own Hennessy yeah. and Moet Chandon, and they also own a bunch of wineries. So one of the wineries they own was Cloudy Bay. So in large companies, we often get sent down to represent the area we were selling the wine. And so I'd go down to Cloudy Bay to help make the blends for the US and Canadian palate. And I'm on a plane to Cloudy Bay and I'm thinking, why am I going to Cloudy Bay to make Cabernet, Chardonnay, Merlot, Sauvignon Blanc, Riesling and everything else, when in mm -hmm. fact everyone only wants to drink Sauvignon Blanc. So Forefathers means the premium appellation for that variety in the new world or the best appellation. So Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, McLaren Vale Shiraz and from Australia. Uco Valley Malbec from Argentina, and obviously Cabernet is the best in California. Yeah. So this is before layer cake, cupcake, and all the other bloody cakes that screwed everything. <laughs> this is uh, this is single vineyard, single varietal, single vintage, and this wine is sustainable. Uh, this is the registration for sustainability in New Zealand. Uh, there's only three places in the world where we have sustainability. Chile is the second one, which is they're about halfway through that process now. And the third place is Sonoma County, not Napa, Sonoma. So uh, we have our rules wow. and regulations in Sonoma too. This is a pair of boots that I used to wear when I walked around Simi. For those who've got a bottle, you'll see the pair of boots uh, that I used to wear. 
I wrote my own constitution when I became an American citizen. I wrote a constitution about family farming and responsible responsibility uh, in terms of the way we grow food. And this is John Hancock's signature I stole from the constitution and changed to my own name. And Waxi is really unique. Waxi <laughs> is the name of the bird that eats all the grapes. And uh, so they, they eat nothing but grapes and they feed for 30 miles. They're a pain in the neck. So if you go outside, you see a full flock, like 2,000, you go with a gun, you shoot. If you didn't kill at least seven birds, it was a bad shot. So anyway, wow. this is a memorial to all the birds we've killed in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and I made this wine called Singing Tree, which we were talking about earlier, Matt, when we were offline. But Singing Tree's got birds on the label too. But because I live in California, we can't shoot those birds. We have to look after them. What do you think? So you have to play loud music at them. Yeah, <laughs> they put up scarecrows. Yeah. So, as I said, we don't, and we don't sell this, there's two unique things. Number one, it's single vineyard, which I mentioned. And number two is we don't sell it to the British because the British want to drink asparagus and cut grass. They want to have it sit it. I mean, look at what they eat. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, at least in the US, we drink, we eat Mediterranean food. So we want to have the wine that be a little bit more fleshy and, but, you know, Mike, when I, when I drink this wine, man, when I worked at Simi, we made Sauvignon Blanc. And there was this dish that our chef used to make. It was asparagus wrapped in prosciutto with just a little bit of lemon juice over the top. And when you put that lemon juice on there, that cuts the acidity and makes the wine taste even sweeter. So it's the same thing. When, you know, when you think about what you want to eat with wine, make sure it's got more of it, you know, and then it, it'll mask, it'll change the palate for you. Um, ex don't do it with chocolate though. Sweetened chocolate never works with Cabernet. You've got to do unsweetened chocolate. And if you've got a really bad young red wine, the big trick is eggplants. Wow. All right. A nice eggplant parmesan. Eggplant. Yeah, perfect. Because eggplant has got a lot of bitterness and so it'll make the, the young red wine taste sweet and mature. Mm. Very good. Pearls. You're giving us pearls, Nick. You pay for so what you get, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I like about your uh, this Sauvignon Blanc is you strike that balance between that nice New Zealand character you kind of expect, but it doesn't have that racy acidity that just, you know, makes me have to sprint for the Tums at the end of the night. You know? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, everything in my life is a story, right? So one day I'm in Portugal working for LVMH again and I don't know, this is 1992. I'm going to Portugal. I'm in the Douro. And I'm having breakfast, lunch, and dinner with Portuguese winemakers. What do you drink? You drink port. And the reason why Portuguese are really skinny is not because the economy sucks, but because the, um, the food is really hard to eat. They eat these barnacles. They're about that long. And you need three of them, right? Three of them for a mouthful. It's 110 degrees, and you're drinking port. So... I said to the winemaker I was with on this particular day, I said, you got any white wine here? He goes, no, Nick, we don't make white wine in Portugal. And the young lady in the restaurant goes, don't worry, I'll take care of it. She comes back out, pours a glass of white wine up to here, like my mother, you know, the condensation's pouring off. It's 110 <laughs> degrees. I'm eating barnacles. And I get the glass and I go, like, shoot, man. All the enamel on my teeth is gone. The roof of my mouth is gone. I'm like, what was that? You know? <laughs> I didn't know what a Vino Verde was, Matt, but I'm sure you do. But yeah. a Vino Verde, is, is, it's a really interesting, it's an interesting wine, but it's an interesting style too. And the key thing about that Vino Verde, that sensational, that memory, and I distinctly remember this, where I was sitting and what I was drinking, but I just get that drinkability, you know? Like, am I hungry or thirsty? Yeah. Because I, I can sell you one glass of wine. I mean, Matt, you can sell a glass of wine to anyone, but can you sell yeah. two? That's yeah. the key. <laughs> <laughs> so I got a question here, um, Nick. Uh, what are the main differences and or similarities you found between American palate and the New Zealand palate? No one has ever asked me that question before, and I'm totally unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, well, again, for me, it's. What wines do I like? The wines that I drink, right? When I walk into a store, because of who I am or because of my experience, I drink wines of 
people that I've met or people that I know or somebody recommended. I don't just walk in and buy a wine because it's got a print label from Russian River. I don't do that. Yeah. So <clears throat> what I think about in terms of the story is that, but in terms of the palate, it, it, it goes back to a lot of food, you know? Mm -hmm. So in New Zealand, we eat unbelievable amount of vegetable, fresh vegetables. And um, so our food generally has a lot more acidity in it anyway. Uh, we grow a lot of beef and lamb and venison, of course, but we export most of it. And so what people generally eat is fish because, you know, we've got 2 million miles of coastline and beef and lamb is too expensive for us because the Americans and the Japanese and the British are all buying it. And we can't compete. So the palate difference I would say is that in New Zealand, and my palate I think is still a little bit like this, we either drink wines super young or super old. We don't really drink wines in the middle. We don't normally drink wine. Like the minimum wine that we would drink today would be like a 2015, 16. Anything older than that, it's got to be really old. And so I think that uh, New Zealanders look for fresher wines and definitely, definitely less oak and less alcohol. Yeah. And I noticed that, you know, I do a lot of consulting. I consult for 16 wineries around the world and all in South America or in Canada and Mexico, but not a lot in California. If I gave you a 16 Cabernet, 16 alcohol Cabernet from Maipo, from um, Mendoza, from Barossa and from Napa and lined them up for you and asked you to guess which wine is from which country, you can't tell them apart. But if I gave you those wines at 13 and a half, 14 alcohol, you probably could. Yeah. So I think the big thing that hasn't hit, I mean, Americans still drink the big name brands mm -hmm. and those big name brands were, became popular with Parker Spectator because they picked it very high alcohol and when, okay, very high sugar. So there's two forms of sugar. There's sucrose, sorry, glucose and fruit, fructose. You call it fructose. We call it fructose, glucose and fructose. So when you have this amount of sugar and then you add the yeast, the sugar starts to decrease and the alcohol starts to increase. When the alcohol, if the alcohol is, if the sugar is too high, the alcohol goes up very quickly and the sugar that remains in the wine is all fructose. And fructose is a very sweet, syrupy sugar. So even though the sugar is a very low volume, it tastes extremely sweet. So when you drink wines of 14 and a half, 15, 14, the only thing I drink over 14 and a half alcohol is Zinfandel, and I never drink anything over 15. So, but once you hit 15 alcohol for Napa Cab, and there are plenty. Yeah, there are. They're all full of sugar, man. Yeah. They're all full of fructose. Can... And... You know, the, you, know the names, on my shelf. <laughs> you know the names I'm talking about. You know those yes. guys that you can only get a six pack per year. They're the people. Yep. <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. Yeah. So, um, the second wine that I'm going to open is uh, Fidelity. Do you have that, Matt? Or am I yes, drinking wine? No, so, here we go. This is a very interesting, this is a sad story. In fact, um, this is a story about small independent businesses who are really hurting right now. So please go to Garfield's and buy my wine. Um, <laughs> the, uh, so the year is 2000, uh, 2002. And I got a call from a very good friend of mine. His name was Al Delormier. Al and Sandy Delormier, unfortunately, both passed away in recent times. But um, Al called me up because he had, he had sold his wine. I knew his vineyard really well because I'd been making Steamy Reserve Cabernet off it for, for 15 years. Anyway, uh, he, he, he was a new buyer. He came in and bought the vineyard. He decided to build a winery. So he built a winery, ran it for a few years, sold it. And he sold the grape contracts for three years. So he calls me up and he goes, Nick, I'm going to go bankrupt. And I said, why? What, what, what happened? He goes, well, I've been paid for the winery, but I haven't been paid for the grapes for three years. And all the wine is sitting in tanks. So I went up to the winery and the winemaker there was a very good friend of mine. So I tasted all the wines and there was Cabernet Merlot, Cabernet Franc and a little bit of Petit Bidot at the time. And uh, the, the 2000 vintage, 2001 and 2002 were all still in tank. They were still separated out. 
Then I tried the wines. I thought, man, these are fantastic. So I called up a buddy of mine who's no longer with a company called Sam's Club Walmart. Um, <laughs> and said, hey, dude, I got, I got uh, 5,000 cases of rocket fuel here. I think you should try it. You know, three vintages. It's red blend. And uh, he goes, great. We called it Fidelity. We put a heart on the label and we launched it on nice. Valentine's Day. It became very successful very quickly. Nice. Two years later, Bob calls me back and goes, Nick, I can't sell the last 500 cases. And I'm like, Bob, dude, I haven't come out of the uh, closet yet. I'm still working for corporate world. Uh, <laughs> what am I going to do with 500 cases? So I quickly called up three distributor friends, New Jersey, Indiana, and Massachusetts, and they agreed to take the 500 cases. Next day, 92 points, best by wine enthusiast. Bob calls me back and goes, can I get my wine back? <laughs> no. <laughs> so now it's available at Garfield's, and it's no longer at Sam's Club and Walmart. And you'll notice on the label, the heart is broken. <laughs> it's a nice. broken heart. <laughs> it's a sad story. <laughs> Many a sad story behind a glass of wine, right? Oh, it's a terrible story. So we kept the brand going. We still have it. We only make, we, we don't make 5,000 cases anymore. It's like 2,000 cases. And, uh, but, it, and the, actually the reason why we leave it at 2,000 cases is because the wine's too cheap. Um, <laughs> it's too much. No, it's too much of a bargain. If you think of this wine, it's an Alexander Valley Cab. So 85% of the wine is Cab Malot. Yes. And the other, and the balance, the other 15 is, is Franc Petit. And what are you selling it for, Matt? Uh, I think we're doing, uh, you might not like this number, but we're going to do it for $14.99 or $13.99 today. For I mean, people. are you kidding me? Yeah. I'm put, I mean, this is why I don't, this is why we only make 2000 cases because yeah. it's, I can't make a living on it, you know, because people don't know what it is. It's, you know, because it, it's not as popular as Chelsea and Catherine and, and then you clowns come along and sell it for fourteen ninety nine. No wonder no one can make any money out of it. My nose that red. <laughs> so um, anyway, this is the I've got the two thousand eighteen. I'm opening the two thousand eighteen. Yeah, that's what that's what everybody should have with them now. Okay, so and, uh, we well, that's good because we only bottled we didn't bottle the eighteen that long ago. And uh, anyway, eighteen vintage. Well, you know, I, I'm not going to do this today because I'm on vacation, but, well, I will be on vacation in five minutes. The, um, <laughs> if you look at the vintages from 1980 to 2020, the bad, here, are the, here are the bad vintages. 82, 83, 88, 89, 93, 2003. Oh. So, if you did that in France, <laughs> and some people will say 2011, but remember 2011, 2010 was a cold vintage. Actually, 2010 is a really special vintage. It's not, it's not pleasing to everybody, but I love 2010 because the alcohols were low. 2011, it rained in Paso Robles and everyone, oh my God, the whole vintage is screwed in, in California. But it takes me seven and a half hours to drive to Paso Robles. It's just, California is the same size as New Zealand. It's the same size as Japan. It's the same size as England. And we're here and we mm -hmm. have to drive down here to get to Paso Robles, but it rained in Paso Robles. And so anyway, and then 2012, I mean, 2012 yeah. was probably, there's not many 11 out of 10 vintages, but 2012 was one of them. And then we had 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. They're all the same. 18, yeah. Is very similar to 13 though because they were both earlier vintages he slightly heavier crop bigger bigger berry size because we had rain earlier uh, 16 and 17 are probably going to be better for aging because they're a little bit they've got a little bit more acidity uh, 2020 is very fleshy and quite ripe as well so yeah 2018 I have no problem with it all and uh, that's what I've got here so speaking of uh, past vintages Sorry, I got a question from uh, Joe and Sheila Sacramento. They have a, a bottle of the 2008 uh, Yeoman Plus, and they want to know uh, when do you think they should open it? Right here, right now, because they're in Sacramento. <laughs> they're in Sacramento, and I'm very close. I'm in Tahoe. <laughs> well, you can drive on up. <laughs> you can drive on up. I haven't had a 2008 Yeoman Plus forever. 
Um, I had a 2007, which was another phenomenal year. 2008 is probably better than seven. 2008 had better acidity. Uh, it's going to be a bit fresher than the 2007. 2007 was more flashy. People loved 2007 when it came out. And I had a 2007 at Christmas time and uh, showed really well. And one of the, the, the key thing for me about wine is, especially red wine, as wines age, they go purple, red, brown to orange. You guys have seen that. And as wines age, you get that crusty stuff here, right? You sometimes see that when you lie a bottle down or whatever, you see like a crusty pigment here. What that is, is polymeric pigment. So that means the wine is losing color, but it's also losing tannin and fruit. And so if you see crusty stuff on the side of your bottle, and it's not your birth year, the year you were married, the year of your first child, get rid of it. <laughs> that wine is not going anywhere. And I learned this technique years ago. I worked with a guy called Michelle Rolon, a very famous consultant when I was at Simi, long story. But anyway, he taught me two things, how to be a consultant and how to control the crusty stuff. So, um, yeah, so my wines won't go crusty. They'll go purple and they'll go red. But so far, since I went out on my own, there's no, per there's no orange or brown. And a lot of that's to do with the oxygen control, et cetera. So the main compound that makes a wine purple is called an anthocyanin. An anthocyanin is, I'm not going to draw it for you, but it's three benzene rings. Remember the benzene rings? Do you remember your Melvin and three glucosides and your flavanols, Matt? So, <laughs> you know, when you went to school, well, maybe you, you dodged chemistry, I don't know. But the, uh, the yeah. parent company is called a flavanol and a yeah. Melvin and three glucoside is a carbohydrate. And one of the um, offshoots of that is called an anthocyanin, A N T H O O. Y C N. So this three benzene rings joined together with a couple of hydroxyl ions, OH, OH, hanging off the end. This you provide heat, light, air, and time to this compound, it joins on another one. This becomes a tannin and this is red. You provide more heat, light, air, and time, crusty stuff. Huh? That's polymeric pigment falling down. <laughs> so yeah. the idea is to get all that to happen in the tank before we bottle it so that the consumer doesn't have to put up with this stuff. So don't make wine more complicated than it needs to be. But tannin is, anthocyanins are really important. I mean, that's the antioxidant. It's the thing that holds um, the, the wine together. And when I say antioxidant, you're all talking about reversitrol and all this stuff where blood thinner, but actually tannin is also a preservative. So a lot of things are preserved using tannin just like in wine. And so um, it's um, wine is an amazing thing. It's not it like, is. you know, when I made beer for three years, I get to tell the story once. When I go to work to make beer, I do the same thing I did yesterday. It's the same thing tomorrow. <laughs> when yeah. I, I work for LVMH and Diageo and UDV, IDV, I mean, gin, guess what? It's the same as, it's the same as tomorrow. Yeah. But with wine, I get to talk about the people, the places, the history, the vintages. I mean, wine is a story. It has to taste good, don't get me wrong, but the story has to be equally as good and it has to have a good story and a good background. And a, and, and this is a place. Whoever's yeah. in Sacramento, you can come and see, you can come and see this place. You can come to the Yeoman Vineyard and touch and feel it. It's not like some of my big brothers who make big blends and they're a bit from Monterey and a bit from Sonoma and a bit from that, no. We don't do that. Everything is one vineyard, one vintage, one variety, except for this. This is the only blend I make. Yeah. Man, it's tasting and, good, man. And it is. It, I, it, we've been carrying it for quite a few years now, and it, it just always over delivers for the price point. You, you Put the price up. Make some money. <laughs> we'll do. We'll do after tonight. Okay, good, good. I want you to, so stay, this in is, I want you to stay in business, man. So this is, as you know, and I want everybody to know this, this is our first uh, virtual or online or Zoom, whatever you want to call this type of tasting. And, you know, just tickled pink that you uh, chose us to, to help us do this, Nick. And, um, you know, just a treat. And, uh, you know, we want to make it a success and see where we go from here and uh, need feedback, input, and how to do this better every single day, you know. And, and to your point, when you open up a bottle of wine, you, you're creating a story, you're, you're, you're sharing something special. And, you know, I hope everybody gets that feeling today. So, but I think, I mean, we're winemakers and 
we don't know too much about sales and marketing. Unfortunately, we're having to learn that. But Matt, you're the key guy. I mean, you're the own. I mean, I'm telling you my stories. So hopefully you can translate that to, um, and this is what makes you difference to total. I'm yeah. not going to sell my wine at total. They're going to go to Garfield's and they're going to say, Hey, Matt, what did you drink last night? What did you eat it with? You know, what did you eat with? You the guy, you're the personal story. This is what separates you from these larger retailers and supporting mid-sized companies, small mid-sized companies is so, so important. And, you know, I embrace it. And if you want to do the same thing next Friday, I'm in. All right. Sounds good. Thursday, next Thursday. Sorry. Next Thursday Sorry. after vacation. All right. Oh, no, Please. Yeah, yeah. After vacation. I'll be back at work on Thursday. <laughs> all right let me um i am uh i'll share my screen again i'll see where we got up to all right so we got up to the sauvignon blanc it's i don't know what you're selling it for uh, matt but usually it's above 20 bucks this just got 90 points from Catherine fallis and it just got rated by uh three new zealand wine raters too one gave it a 91 one gave it a 92 91 is from the tasting panel, which is Anthony Diaz Blue, who's become a real phenomenal out here. For those who don't, I don't know, for those who are looking for the next, who are sick of the spectator enthusiast, uh, Parker, try the tasting panel and uh, Anthony Diaz Blue, uh, the Somme Journal is the other one. But tasting panel, this is becoming really, really important magazine out here in, in California. All right, this is Fidelity. I, um, I told you a little bit about it and it's 85% Cabernet and Merlot and the 15% is made up of, of um, Petit Bordeaux and, uh, and Cab Franc. I'm not a big Cab Franc fan, but I plan and I planned a little bit of Malbec. So in the long term, I'm going to transfer this over to uh, one of my own vineyards. But I will say that when people say, oh, I don't drink Syrah or I don't drink Zinfandel, when you drink a red blend, where do you think the Syrah went? <laughs> or where do you think the <laughs> Merlot went? A lot of people don't drink. Merlot is still the number one red grape grown in the world. No. So, um, please bear that in mind. And there's a reason. I mean, Petrus is is Merlot. Um, uh, O'Brien is Merlot. I mean, Ripe Bank is, is fantastic. So don't, don't knock it, man. Uh, and Cabernet is always more spicy and a lot of people don't like green wine, green red wines. And that's why they, that's why they make wine Cabernet on such high alcohol because they're, they're trying to make these things, uh, less green. Well, if you don't like green, drink Merlot. Anyway, so for us in the Alexander Valley, obviously Merlot and Cabernet are the best fits, but I really like Petit Bordeaux and I'm gradually going to increase that. And, um, yeah, so, uh, we'll so the Petit Bordeaux and that, that just gives it more of that kind of plush fruit note to it is that what if you, yeah if you think about your tongue so the front of the tongue this is where you, what we call the elegant wines this is where merlot is merlot is going to give you a little bit more red fruit aromatic cabernet is going to be at the back of the mouth that's going to give you more power and weight and then right at the back of the mouth what we call density uh giving the wine structure and density that's where petit bordeaux typically fits okay. uh, the other the other two varietals Depends on how they're grown. Cabernet Franc tends to be a little bit more spicy, a little greener. Uh, that's why a lot of Cabernet Franc, again, is grown and produced at 15 alcohol, which uh, that's why I stay away from. Cabernet Franc takes a lot of work to get ripe without it being green. So you've got to drop half the fruit on the ground. So that's an expensive process. And then Malbec. Uh, Malbec's another whole conversation because a lot of what you guys drink when you drink a Malbec from Argentina, you may not be drinking Malbec, you may be drinking Cot. Cot is another clone of Malbec, which is a French clone. It's not really Malbec. So I make a wine called Chakras, Matt. I don't know if you have that wine, but Chakras yes, is 100% Malbec. It would normally retail about 24, 25 bucks, something like that. Uh, yeah, so I want it to be round and lush, and it's certainly one of the best Valley wines from the Alexander Valley, and I don't send it to review because uh, it uh, it always outshines some of my other wines, which, uh, which are, <laughs> I have more of them to sell. Well, which, which is pretty amazing. So I, I got one quick question for you, Nick. Yeah. Um, did you always set out to have your own label, or did you work, or did your... Sorry, or did your work consulting make you decide to go ahead and do it yourself? 
man, where are, where are these people living? They're asking me the tough questions. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys drink? They're obviously not drinking enough or something. I don't know. Um, my father, my father, who was a land surveyor, and uh, he, he was on the fourth expedition to the South Pole. <clears throat> so he was one of these sort of explorers and entrepreneurial. And he went out on his own when he was uh, 28 years old. And I always thought, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a corporate, I was a corporate winemaker for, you know, 25 years, 26 years. And I, but I didn't want to retire without having a crack at doing it by myself. Just like my, I didn't want my father coming back to me, dude, you never went out on your own. You never really made, made yourself a, made yourself a real person or whatever, you know, he was going to criticize me for. But uh, so, you know, until you grow, until you buy a piece of dirt, plant a grape, make the wine, sell the wine, or find a way to s distribute it, you're not a real winemaker. Because you're actually only got part of the story. Look, we can all make wine. Matt, even you can make, you know, I could ferment your shirt, Matt. <laughs> I put it put it in a bucket with some water and some sugar and I throw in some yeast. I can make alcohol out of your shirt. It's not yeah, a yeah. big deal. Making alcohol is easy. Yeah. But making good wine right. at a good price and having people want to pick up the bottle is very hard. Yeah. So So it's in So it's in your DNA either way. You were meant this destiny brought you to this, right? If anyone's willing to buy me, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. And, and the other thing too is because consulting is such a big part of what I do. Uh, it probably takes up 30%, 40% of my time. I'm, I get higher powered jobs because I'm more vertical, if that makes sense. Um, Whereas if I'm just a winemaker that gets 95 points on everything, but I don't know how to contract a vineyard or, and buy tanks and, and package the wine correctly and all, I mean, yeah, you know, that's not, that's not adding value to what they need. Cause a lot of these companies today are trying to find their way in the market, but I do, I, I work for some very, very large companies. Like you would know them. And, uh, so I'm also so I guess it's almost like a mentorship for the winemaker as well because the winemakers tend to be younger, and they work for these massive companies. And I like it because it's a, it's 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 stimulus for me because I'm still involved in large companies with thousands of employees, and I and I still I, I get that little piece that I don't have anymore. So I do value those clients extremely, but then I come back to Little Old Healsburg and. <laughs> Punch down, punch down my my bins. I pick my grapes. I drive a tractor or whatever I need to do. You know, so I don't know. Good question again. Good question. Yeah. Did I make the right decision? I don't know. <laughs> Only Matt can answer that because it depends how many of my wines are in his store. So you know, uh, well, quite a, quite a few. You'd be you'd be impressed. You'd be very proud of Susan and what what we bring into the store and my customers and what they buy from me. So anyway. All right, well, let's jump into where are we? This is about oh my goodness, we've got twenty minutes. I thought we only had half we had a half an hour more. Okay, so <laughs> let's um so let me go down here. So these are my five children. This is my front yard. <laughs> uh, these two are, so this is Catherine, this is Hillary, and this is Chelsea. Uh, we don't talk about my boy. He's a, he's actually a legitimate winemaker. He's a He's actually creating a name for himself right now. The, um, but, uh, so actually I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the story because I don't, I don't normally tell the story, Matt, but the year is, uh, I don't know, 2006 and I get a call from my wife and all I hear is, honey, I'm too drunk. I can't go to the parent teacher night at school. <laughs> okay. This is the worst phone call a father can have. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a lose-lose situation because you can't say anything because if you if the teacher criticizes your kid and you shoot back your wife's going to get a phone call if you criticize the teacher the headmaster is going to call your wife so it, it's lose. anyway 
you wouldn't believe it, it was a, cha a life changing experience. I arrived and they broke the room up on firstborn, secondborn, thirdborn, twins, and lastborn. So I'm a firstborn. I had to learn how to do this. This is not a firstborn trait. Matt, what order are you? Second? <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure. I'll go with second. <laughs> so what are you? What are you? Uh, yeah, second point. You are second born. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm number eight. Holy cow. How many children? Yeah. Uh, I was my youngest of eight. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> anyway, there's a joke there, at, but anyway. well, last borns are very similar to first borns. Anyway, I don't know about star <laughs> signs, but birth order is so, so important. So anyway, um, I'm sitting at the big boy table because I'm a firstborn and we're all sitting there, right? So there's a piece of paper in front of us all. And uh, what do firstborns do? We don't make eye contact. We go straight to the task. The rest of the room is really noisy, but we like go straight to the questions and we start answering the question. And at the bottom of the paper, and you firstborns out there will know this, at the bottom of the paper, it says elect a spokesperson for the group. What does a firstborn think? Firstborn goes, if no one else volunteers, I'll volunteer. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, volu I volunteered after 20 seconds at exactly the same time as the other 13 firstborns. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this. The secondborns are like, hey, can we get a firstborn over here? The thirdborns <laughs> the third are like, the thirdborns, the middle children. What was the question? Because, you know, they're all, still, they're all still talking about themselves. And the lastborns are like, we ordered a cheeseburger. So, and I see this in my kids. So when you look at the label, you'll notice that Catherine, the middle child, she faces the other direction uh -huh. because she's the middle child. She's the storyteller, the manipulator, the liar. Well, what they, what middle children say is that they're the peacemakers. Yeah. They're the peacemakers because they're the manipulators. Anyway, whatever. Yeah. So um, Chelsea's the oldest. We're going to try that. And then we're going to try Catherine and Hillary is uh, we're all sold out, unfortunately, but, um, this is Hillary with one L, not two. And she was supposed to be a boy. And when she popped out, she was a girl. So we had to come, we were going to call her Sean. And uh, so we had to quickly come up with a name. So she's named after Sir Edmund Hillary. Sir ah. Edmund Hillary was the first man to climb Mount Everest, but he also happens to be a New Zealander. Right. So this is the Alexander Valley, Cloverdale, not Overdale, Cloverdale. Um, this is the Russian River. This is Fitch Mountain. This is the town of Healdsburg where my office is, and that's where I live. I live in Dry Creek. This is Dry Creek. This over here is Chalk Hill, and to the south here is Russian River. The Russian River came down here, and it does a loop around Fitch Mountain. So the Fitch, there was an earthquake, and Fitch Mountain was lifted up. I don't know if you know this, but Alexander, the Russian River formed the Napa Valley too. But Mount St. Helena blocked off the Russian River during an earthquake, and that's why the Russian River now flows out to Jenna through the Russian River valley but we need about another 30 million years to make it a real story anyway so <laughs> it's a good marketing story so um we're going to try chelsea which comes from uh just uh east of geyserville the fidelity vineyard that we were talking about earlier comes from up here and then uh staircase which is my my new property which i bought about three years ago and forefathers which forefathers cabinet loan tree comes from up here and then we'll talk about Catherine a little later, which is uh, the vineyard to the south. So this wine is, uh, in a nutshell, is what we call a, a Cabernet Drinker's Merlot. So the key thing about Merlot, I don't know if I have it here. So this just got 96 points in a double gold in the San Francisco wine competition. It got 93 in the Wine Spectator. And uh, so it's a, it's a phenomenal wine. I'm gonna show you a couple of videos here. So hang on tight here, Matt. G'day, Nick Goldschmidt here. I'm standing out here in the Chelsea Merlot Vineyard, Alexander Valley. And we are about, I don't know, 70, 80% through Veraison. If you can see down here, if I move a few clusters, uh, leaves I mean, you can see that uh, we're colouring up quite nicely. A little way to go. This is the uh, second week of um, September that we're looking about in terms of harvest. And that would be about right on average, so uh, looking good. We love the soil here, a lot of good water holding capacity. We've got a long way to go in terms of holding this canopy on, but we're in really good shape and really excited about the 2019 Chelsea Goldschmidt Alexander Valley 
Merlot out here in the Alexander Valley. Beautiful. Love it. Hi, I'm Chelsea Goldschmidt, and after my workouts, I always crave a nice glass of Merlot. So, I'm obviously drinking my favorite Merlot, the Chelsea Goldschmidt. This one is 2017 from Alexander Valley. Reminds me of back home in Sonoma County while I'm here in isolation in the Bay Area. So let's see how it is. It's the perfect wine for isolation, drink by yourself, or if you need a glass after spending the day with your family, it's always there. So let's see how it is. It smells like black cherry and pomegranate and chocolate. Yum. And it tastes like um, strawberries and plum. It's delicious. I hope you really enjoy it and I hope it keeps you company in your quarantine. Stay safe, everyone. Cheers. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was pretty, Ch it was Chelsea. She did that on her phone. <laughs> so I, I decided to use it, but um, yeah. yeah. I don't know why she didn't look steam. <laughs> you didn't look too proud there. <laughs> So I make wines with my daughter. So when I make wine with Chelsea, it's really interesting because she's first born. So she wants everything to be perfect. When you drink this wine, it's perfect. As far as I, so it's seamless, it's round, it's rich, and it, there's no edges. And so it's, it, 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 and that's, that's why it's become really, this is the fourth best selling Merlot um, over 20 bucks in California. It's and uh, it's after Duckhorn, Decoy, and St. Francis, which are the three. But yeah, no, it's, I can't believe it. And for Merlot, you know. When it's done right, it's a beautiful thing and you did it right. Thank you. I, I, the, the key, I, I didn't show enough of the soil. So the key thing with Merlot is a Merlot berry weighs 1.2 grams. If you have it on a thinner soil, it dehydrates and it concentrates the sugar acid and tannin and then you have high alcohol and it's not very, you know, I want to keep that berry in good turga, so lots of moisture. And then when I bring it into the winery, I extract the heck out of it because then I, that's how I make the Cabernet drinkers Merlot. So it doesn't have any green, but it's lush and round and black and, you know, like Chelsea said. Yeah. So I get two questions here. I'm going to save one till after we're done tasting the wines, but uh, Laura Weaver wants to know, uh, do you use Malbec and as a blending grape with Cabernet Sauvignon with your cab? No, um, we don't. As I said, everything I do is single, single varietal. Um, so I don't blend anything because I find wine really complicated. <laughs> so I'm trying to make it easy. Yeah. I'm trying to make it one vineyard, one varietal, one vintage, and all vegan. All our wines are vegan as well. No, I think Malbec is a it's a very complicated grape because I love Malbec, but you can grow it in, in probably more flavor profiles than you can Cabernet. And a lot of what we associate with great Malbec is obviously high altitude. So I'm sitting up here in Tahoe. <clears throat> the lake is at 6,000 feet or whatever it is. We grow Malbec at 4,000 feet, but uh, we're a little bit further north, so it can be, you know, because altitude is cold, but if you go more north, it's warmer. So everything is a balance. And so the key is to go, how do I make Malbec be black and licorice like Merlot, and not have the alcohol? Because I think, you know, every, every country, place, whatever, has its own unique char character. I mean, Napa Sonoma is Cabernet, well, Alexander Valley, Napa Valley, is Cabernet country, we know, or Bordeaux country, we know that. But the Malbec, I don't get the fine tannins. I don't get the velvet. Uh, we talk about velvety tannins and we talk about um, blueberry fruits. We don't get that with Malbec in California. The alcohol tends to, because the, the crop load is lower, so the canopy screams up and so we get faster alcohol accumulation. So I'm not a real big fan of Malbec from um, California. So. I will use it only as a blender. And I, I have planted it on the staircase vineyard. And uh, I think it's going to be a good attribute in that style because I put it on a little bit more of a clay soil. 
because clay is going to give you a little bit more water holding capacity than a loamy soil. And it's quite different. A lot of people don't grow Malbec on a clay, but I wanted to try it on a clay soil. So we'll give it, a, it's only a couple of acres. We'll see how it goes. It'll be awesome. We'll try it. I'll call <laughs> you when we're ready. All right. Actually, I'm going to get a small crop this year on a, I, I planted it on a, on a gold blaze system. So it's straight up and then I'm making a tunnel. I'm trying, I'm tying it over the top. So I get more leaf canopy and uh, oh. balance crops. So it's quite, it's, it's an Italian system. They use it on Sangiovese. So I thought I'd give it a go on Melbeck. It's, it's just, it's a half acre block that um, I'm doing it on Melbeck. Nice. All right. Last one of the evening is uh, let's jump back. Let's get rid of Chelsea. So we're going to talk about Cabernet. So we do a lot of Cabernet. So from Oakville, I don't do Napa generically. I do Oakville. We make a wine called Ultimatum. This is $500 a bottle. We haven't released it in Chicago. Uh, I only make 50 cases. Game Plus, I make 100 cases, just four barrels. Game Ranch uh, is about 400 cases. And then Hillary, which is about 2,000 cases. And then we do make a wine uh, from Yonville. This is a special wine we call Yardstick. Anyway, we're talking about Alexander Valley. So we make a Yeoman Plus, like the Game Ranch Plus. This vineyard is between Screaming Eagle and Tench and Plump Jack and Rudd. Over here, we're talking about uh, Robert Young, Lancaster, Jordan, Silver Oak. And then we make Yeoman, Forefathers, which is the 50. So this is our 150. This is 75, this is 50, and then Catherine is usually about 25 bucks, but I've seen it cheaper than that. Matt, what are you selling it for tonight? I, you're going to be mad at me again. Christ. Uh, <laughs> we try to be around uh, 20 every day, but today okay, that, we're, no, we're going to be 17.99 today. Sorry, Matt, Nick. Matt, you're crazy, mate. That's stupid price. No, we're, we're 24, 25 bucks. I don't know. You must be giving it. Are you actually paying your bills? I hope I'm not your bank. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no. Well, the Boston didn't see the, uh, the, the margins on this one. So, you know, sometimes it's better to ask for forgiveness than permission, Nick. Yeah, well, this one always scores like 90, 92 points. Uh, yeah. And it just took away a double gold medal in a recent wine competition too. But anyway, so... This is uh, 128, this is the key road uh, coming through the Alexander Valley. Highway 101 is over here. 128 takes you over into Knights Valley and into Napa. So this is the Geyser Peak is up here where the name Catherine is. And the fires in 2019 came down Geyser Peak. And there's a barn, I don't know if you can see it on the photo there, that barn is gone. Oh, this barn here, you can see it. That barn was burnt in the 2019 Ooh. fires. Uh, this is Yeoman. This is an old terrace vineyard and Catherine comes from right below it. So originally this was owned by two owners and today it's owned by five owners and we buy grapes from all five. It's a real valley. But uh, vineyards don't burn. Secondly, smoke does not affect wine unless you get fires during Verazon. And in 2019 we got the fires during harvest and so uh, no problem with this nebulous term called smoke taint. It's a very hard thing to describe. Um, but I have a lot of experience with fires and smoke. But I assure you that 2019, the fires were so late that uh, you're quite okay to be drinking uh, Alexander Valley and Napa wines from 2019. Uh, key elements for me is the Piedmont. So we look for uh, mid slope. I don't like to be on the top of the hill for this wine because it's uh, the soil is too thin. I like morning sun, so I like the east facing. Obviously, it's low yield, it's cane pruned. I don't want to get into that, it's not spur pruned, but it means that the, the clusters are more spread out across the canopy. And, uh, and this vineyard, we talk about old wine Zinfandel, but this vineyard is old wine Cabernet. This is 40 years old Cabernet. The life expectancy of vineyard is 30. Is that pre Cabernet? Yes, so this is pre phylloxera So phylloxera came in 1990. So most vineyards were replanted in 89, 90. Uh, but this vineyard was on a resistant rootstock prior to that time, so it still exists. And uh, yeah, so the older I get, 
the older I like my vineyards. <laughs> I, I thought it was funny, Matt. They came out, the wine enthusiasts came out with the 40 best winemakers under 40 years old. I don't know if you saw that article, but um, I would, I, I'm, they're definitely the wines. When Kim Jong-un drops a nuclear bomb on California and you go to the bunker and you have to choose which wine you're going to take, I'm not going to take a wine from a guy that's only 40 years old. Because <laughs> he hasn't even made wine. He hasn't even made wine for five years from the same vineyard, let alone 10 or 30. I want to know if my wine's going to age. I'm going to be downstairs for a number of years. Yes, yeah. So I'm hoping they'll do the 50 best winemakers over 50. <laughs> you got my vote, uh, my friend. <laughs> and then uh, we do stem. We don't crush. It's, so we're pretty much whole berry. We don't add any yeast. I don't add any um, additions at all. And um, here we go. This is a... Um, it's not going to run. But basically... The vineyard is uh, made up of three quadrants. So you'll see, if, if I show a still photo, I'm not going to do it now. But on the well, if you take an aerial of the vineyard, you'll see it's a classic Cabernet vineyard because Alexander Valley, because, I mean, the reason why we live in California is because it's an earthquake zone. And so earthquakes give us different soils. This is why New Zealand is interesting. This is why Chile and Argentina are interesting because we have a lot of earthquakes in California. I don't know what Australia is. It's a big flat pancake, but um, <laughs> I can pick up a stone and throw it and I'm in, a, I'm in a different soil. So the way we look at it is we look at canopy, right? So you have a big green canopy. It generally means that you have very low crop because the vine is producing too many leaves and too many shoots, but it's ripening that fruit really quickly. And those wines give you the density, the structure and the finish that we were talking about perhaps with Petit Bidot as an example. And then on the other extreme is you have a smaller canopy with bigger crop. So we have to drop a lot of crop on the ground to make sure that we get it riper. But those wines are more elegant. We pick them, but we pick them later. I know it sounds really funny. The bigger canopy has a lot of power and is ripening the grape very quickly. So we picked them a little bit earlier. And that's what I didn't understand. When I was a young winemaker, I didn't understand that the big canopy vines were the wines, vines I should have been picking earlier and the low canopy vines I should have been picking later. And so it took me, you know, 10 years to figure that bit out. So that's <laughs> what we do. Yeah. Love, lovely Cabernet though. Oh yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, uh, again, it's, for well, I can't quote you because you're under you're under twenty bucks. But <laughs> for over over twenty bucks, um, if you're talking about iconic, I mean, great Cabernet for between twenty and twenty five bucks. There's four producers: Rodney Strong, Saint Francis, AVV, and Catherine. Yeah, above twenty five bucks. We're above 50 bucks, you're Napa Valley. So you're spending a lot more money. But if you want to spend under between 20 and 25, typically those are the four wines you buy, four Cabernet yeah. you buy. And uh, Catherine that you're trying now is number three. It's ahead of Saint, it's ahead of uh, AVV and Rodney Strong are the only two that outsell it. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it outsells both Rodney and AVV at our store. We well, pretty that, well. That, that's impressive so, yeah um i think i have uh, i'll just show you one more so this is uh it's old 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 which i think is the key this location is amazing because i've been working there for for, for 30 years i mean this this used to go into a bottle of wine that sold for 75 dollars this used to be semi reserve cabinet sold for 75 bucks the so same winemaker same vineyard but instead of 75 bucks matt's giving it away for bloody 18, 18 or whatever else. Um, it's an early harvest, so we, we make sure that the alcohol is... is un My goal with this wine, Matt, though, is to get it under 14. So uh, I've gradually brought it down. Today it's about 14.1, 14.2. I don't know what it says on the, oh, actually, on the label, yeah. but... Uh, i got to get my glasses. I can't um, read. It's 14. It's probably 14.4 or something. I don't know. I can't yeah. read it. I don't, uh, I don't have a bottle I, I, in front of me because somebody drank it. <laughs> I got it in front of me, but I don't have my glasses on. It's four, it's 14 plus. I want to say it's like, it's either 14, three or 14, five. So my, yeah, my well, maybe you should put your glasses on when you price the wine. 
Here we I go. am in the Catherine Alexander Valley Vineyard. Uh, sometimes I pinch myself that I'm still making wine here after all this time. But uh, really unique. I don't know if you can see in here. No, you can't up here, perhaps. So these clusters are super loose. We get nice, even uh, ripening throughout. Just a beautiful vineyard, as you can see behind me. We're a couple of days away from harvest. Uh, the leaves are looking. You know, they're right there in terms of their uh, water. And what keeps them in that condition, obviously, is the beautiful gravelly loam soil that we have here and the age of the vine. And I've been working on this vineyard since 1990. Amazing that I'm still making Catherine after all this time. Uh, obviously, the first vintages went to Simi Winery, and we didn't start making Catherine until 2003, I think it was. Anyway, uh, Today is the release of the 2018. Just starting to ship 18, and this is the 19 still on the vine. Still our most popular wine, Catherine Goldschmidt, Alexander Valley Cabernet. G'day. I'm not gonna show you that. Um, so this is, uh, this wine just got 92 points from Wine Enthusiast. It's, uh, uh, we call it the Stone Mason Hill. And uh, the descriptions, you know, it's it's, Alexander Valley typically is a little bit more acidity and tends to be more red fruit. And people often ask me, when do you drink this wine? Well, I, I drink, when I'm having dinner, I drink Catherine. After dinner, when I'm having cheese, I drink Nath. I'll drink the Hillary or the, the Game Ranch or whatever. Because Oakville or Napa Valley is more rich and, and full bodied and it exhausts my palate. So, when I drink Catherine or if I drink a wine from the Alexander Valley, Alexander Valley's got more acidity. And so it's much easier to drink these wines with food. Drinking high alcohol wines that have got sweetness from Napa Valley or whatever with food is a lot, is a lot harder to do. And so, um, as I said, having two glasses, and I notice I, it's, it's much easier. I, I notice when I, when I open an Oakville and a Alexander Valley during dinner, the Alexander Valley is the first wine that goes every time. Anyway, these are my contacts. If you want to follow me, uh, I'm, as I said, I'm going to post this video on, on YouTube and I'll send Matt the link later on. Uh, Goldschmidt Vineyards on Facebook and Goldschmidt underscore Vineyards on Instagram. Uh, and I pretty much post every day on Instagram if you want to follow me there. Uh, and if you come out, this is my contacts, uh, Nick at GoldschmidtVineyards.com. That's my cell phone number. Call me anytime. Our tasting room is called the Poor House. It's out in Dry Creek Road, which is very near my house. And this is the phone number. Now, of course, uh, you can come visit us uh, during the week, but we have to taste outside at this stage. And of course, it has to be um, uh, by appointment. But um, we can certainly accommodate you. It's a, it's a beautiful area. The tasting room, you can see all of Dry Creek and it's, it's, uh, it's fantastic. So, um, I really want to thank you, Matt, for having us on. And you got any more questions? Uh, we got a couple more. The one I wanted to get back to from Laura Weaver is um, uh, she wants to know of the wines you had tonight. We're tasted tonight. What's your favorite? Well, Catherine. Catherine, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, I the the thing about Catherine is, I mean, you you open it and you drink, it and it's just gone. Yeah. But uh, I did notice my wife come over and she just stole like a she filled a glass up to here with Chelsea and went and sat on the deck. <laughs> she loves my, she loves Molo. My, my wife loves Molo. So, uh, and then uh, Dan Rogers uh, wants to know uh, what makes wine vegan, or makes a vegan wine. Yes, this is very important. Um, the 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 main thing is the fining agents. So. We can add things to wine that you would not believe. And it all started with the Greeks. Now, if the Greeks had invented a screw cap, we'd all be drinking wines out of a screw cap. But unfortunately, the Greeks invented a cork. So we all drink oxidized wines. So when we make a wine with a screw cap, we actually have to add chemicals to oxidize it back to make it taste like a cork. It's crazy. <laughs> um, anyway, that's off the subject. Anyway, what the Greeks invented was a thing called a, a sturgeon fish. So they got a sturgeon fish and they took the bladder of the sturgeon fish and the sturgeon fish bladder, not only is it a big fish, but it also expands and they could put wine in it. And then they transported the wine across the oceans on these Greek ships. 
And when the wine arrived, the wine was clear. Not clear, but, um, you know, you could shine a flashlight through a red wine and you could see the, you know, it became, it settled out. They figured out that the sturgeon fish, the swim bladder, was a fining agent. And so people started adding cut up pieces of sturgeon fish to wine. And we used to do this when we were young. They, it would come in plates like this. You could bend it and you just throw it. It dissolves in the wine and it finds the wine. Then they discovered they could add it. They could add blood. I mean, goat's blood they were using. They could add milk. All sorts of things that actually help clarify wine. And you can imagine when you drink milk, you know, you can add, uh, it gives you that textural element. Eggs. A lot of people use egg whites as well. So uh, I do nothing. What you see is what you get. This is as close to the vineyard, close to the cluster, the berries you can get. I don't add any additives at all. Even though I'm so tempted. <laughs> <laughs> Fact, every time I hear, you know, like I got, I got mates of mine who are winemakers, of course, and they're like, dude, we still add egg whites, man. We got egg whites is the way to go. And egg whites, they're a fantastic finding agent. Don't get me wrong. But I want to keep my wine vegan. And my son, my winemaker's son is also vegan. So uh, he's very careful about which wines he buys. It's very important these days. People are, are very much into the vegan and making sure organic and, you know, the whole sustainability. Yeah, and, 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 and sulfur. And sulfur is the other. Sulfur is the big one. And people don't ask me too much about And herbicides. So we don't use any Roundup. Roundup should be ignored. So if you go on my on my YouTube channel, you can or my uh, Instagram, and you'll. So I don't use any herbicides. Everything's done by hand. We weed weed whack everything. Weeds are the big problems. But since I stopped using Roundup, my vineyard is alive. I can yeah. feel it. I can see it. I got good guys, bad guys. I got birds. I got everything. I mean, yeah. animals are living in my vineyard. You know, it's cool. It's, but it's impressive. Food, SO2, sulfur dioxide is a problem, but people don't understand that when, why is it that orange juice doesn't turn orange? Why doesn't apple juice turn brown? Yeah. You gotta ask yeah. yourself these questions, you know? But um, thank you very much for uh, making this a, a great event, Nick. It's just a treat to hear you talk. Uh, the comments I'm getting are your charmer. There's no uh, reason why you're not a success. Um, just, it's just a, a treat, you know, and um, my personal favorite, if anybody cares, is uh, Catherine too. You know, it's kind of what brought me to your, your table than knowing your history, but the Catherine cab is just, just a treat to drink and enjoy on Wednesday night or on a special occasion too. So, um, cool. What else did, and uh, how many do we have uh, logged in? Someone was curious as to how many have attended tonight. At one That's point, there was, at one point there was over 20 right now, we're at 17. Wow. So, and that's, you know, multiples, I'm assuming, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to go through four bottles by myself here, so it's going to be a daunting Come on task. Get those, people from, <laughs> get those people from Sacramento to drive up with that 07, man. I'm willing to do that. Actually, the one, <laughs> so it's funny, the ones that, uh, their their last name is Sacramano, so they're not they they're here in Palatine, but oh oh I oh, oh, I'm Actually, sorry I apologize I apologize. Right. They're they're club members and uh, they've stayed at I believe uh, your uh, cottage in uh, Healdsburg. What? Did yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, Joe and Sheila. So they're they're oh, big okay. fans. Yeah, yeah. Joe and Sheila, please send me an email. You got my email address right? It's right here. Nick at com and let's re let's reacquaint and bring that bottle out next time. <laughs> and then uh, everybody that uh, signed up through us uh, should have gotten a sell sheet today. And you've heard Nick uh, chew me out on multiple occasions for the pricing that I get. Yeah, gave I mean out. that's just soup. That's just, I mean Catherine at under twenty bucks, you're nuts, mate. You know. And we do have we do have some other. Um, we have your um, what else? Hold on, singing sure singing here. tree. Got some Hillary 16 and some Yeoman and Game Ranch 15s. For, yeah, so the uh, Yeoman and Games just got 94 95s from Spectator. The Hillary just got a 93. Did you see that? Best Buy Wine Spectator. Surrounded yeah. by Bond, you know, $700, $800, $700. You know, and there's yeah. Hillary with a big thing. We sold the whole vintage in two days. 
Nice. Well done. Crazy. You. How many cases of Hillary have you got? I think we've got uh, three on reserve right now. Right. So, yeah, I know. Yeah. You, you can probably double your price on that now. <laughs> All right. Well, after today, so you better well, jump on it if you want some. It's the best yeah. value Oakville on the market. I mean, yeah. without doubt. You don't see you don't see Oakville for that price at all. So, yeah. So. And the singing tree. The singing tree is probably the best belly Russian river that you'll get on the in the market too. For those who like chard Chardonnay. <laughs> <laughs> I love Chardonnay. I drink a lot of Chardonnay. Um, but uh, cool. yeah, everybody's. Uh, I hope everybody had fun. And Nick, uh, it's just a treat. Uh, getting to meet you and hopefully everybody gets to see taste and see the charm every in every glass of uh, Goldschmidt wine they have. You're Matt, you're, all, you're so awesome for putting this on, man. I really appreciate it. So thank you. Yeah. And uh, thank you to Susan, my rep for making this happen. And, and my coworker, Danny, who's sitting there enjoying a glass of wine too, I hope. <laughs> Cheers, Danny. Cheers. You rock. And thanks, Susan. You're awesome. All right. Ciao. See you later.